Hegel thought that the task of philosophy was to comprehend its own time in thought. In his book The Philosophy of Right, he stated that the owl of Minerva only ever flies at dusk. The owl was a symbol of wisdom and knowledge in Roman mythology. What he meant was that we only ever truly understand our own time once it's already been crystallized and taken a concrete form. Philosophy, in many senses, always arrives too late to change anything. Because philosophical thought is a product of a particular historical era, it is to a certain extent limited by the confines of its social world. We can therefore see a fundamental difference in the attitudes of Hegel and Marx. For Marx, philosophy should play an active role in shaping history by using its ability to interpret the world to direct historical actors in transforming it. For Hegel, philosophy should attempt to understand and see the kernel of rationality in historical development. Hegel looked to a number of historical processes and saw that above all else, the modern era was defined by a striving for freedom. Arising first out of the Reformation and the French Revolution, Hegel thought that the principle of freedom could be given its most adequate realization in the institutions of the modern state. Hegel didn't think that the Prussian state as it presently existed was rational, but he did think that the form of a state was the most rational kind of social organization that would promote the freedom of its subjects. For Hegel, we should live in states not because they allowed us to do whatever we want, but because they provided a superior form of freedom through our participation in rational social institutions and a guidance on how to live a fully rational and ethical life. I'm James Muldoon, I'm a lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter, and this is an introduction to Hegel's philosophy of right. If you're new to Hegel, then I recommend watching my first video, which is an introduction to Hegel's philosophy. In this video, I give an overview of his method and his system. The French Revolution. Hegel claimed to have drunk a toast to the French Revolution every year. As a young man, he and his friends planted a liberty tree in 1792 in honour of the storming of the Bastille. This might strike some as odd because Hegel is rather critical of the French Revolution in many of his writings. He thought that it enacted an abstract and one-dimensional form of freedom that only wanted to negate and destroy the old order without building any new positive and stable institutions to replace it. The French Revolution, with its continual critique of all of society, inevitably ended up destroying the revolutionaries themselves. The terror and the eventual beheading of Robespierre himself were all actualizations of the revolutionaries' misguided ideals about freedom and politics. For Hegel, this is what a certain one-dimensional view of Enlightenment philosophy would look like when it walked the earth. It's an essential moment for Hegel because it's the emergence of the principle of freedom, negativity, and complete abstraction that has an important role to play in the history of humanity. Hegel attempted to preserve a positive content in the negation of the French Revolution in order to raise it to a higher level. His political philosophy is his answer to the one-sidedness of the French Revolution. His justification for the rationality of the constitutional state is a way of embodying the principle of freedom in a more complex and developed social whole. Freedom and the Will Hegel is concerned with citizens' conception of themselves as political agents. Modernity is defined by the emergence of a new form of rational and universal consciousness. Individuals expect their political institutions to be an expression of their will. Rousseau's notion of a general will embodied this idea that the state should be based on a conscious expression of its members. For this reason, Hegel starts the philosophy of right from the position of an individual's natural will. He'll show that the state is rationally justified as a political system from the position of an individual's consciousness. In modern politics, any political system must accord with the principle of subjectivity, that every individual has a right to subject the basic laws of society to rational scrutiny. Therefore, any given political system must be based on the self-consciousness and understanding of its citizens. It won't count as a genuine actualization of their freedom if individuals can't see themselves in the institutions of their society. 
Much like his other texts, The Phenomenology of Spirit, the philosophy of right is instructive for its readers by moving through several inadequate conceptions of freedom and showing how one inevitably arises at the final standpoint of the rational structure of the state. Freedom can be thought of in three distinct ways, which are reflected in the tripartite structure of the book. The first, most abstract and vulgar conception of freedom for Hegel is the classic Hobbesian understanding of freedom as the ability to do what I want. The second, moral or subjective account of freedom consists in the ability to be the source of one's own normative principles that govern one's life. The third conception is what Hegel calls Zittlichkeit, translated as ethical life. Here, individuals actualize their freedom through participation in social institutions. Hegel's concept of ethical life concerns how we're socialized to do the right thing by a complex network of influences, from our family to friends, schools, the media, and how we see ourselves as citizens. It expresses the idea that there should be an ethical substance to social life that's part of our everyday lives and is embedded in our social institutions. In this final conception, we're only free to the extent that we feel at home in our society and see it as expressing our way of life that we affirm as individuals. In one sense, we don't really get to Hegel's full political philosophy until the third and final section of the book. It's only on this level that we can generate the institutions of the family, civil society, and the state as distinct aspects of a rational organization of modern society. The first conception of freedom is based on the figure of what Hegel calls a person, an abstract individual that affirms their own freedom of thought and movement and claims these as rights. This notion of an abstract individual is first actualized in Roman law, property rights, and an equal standing alongside other citizens. The idea of abstract right is also tied up with Hegel's views on the French Revolution and their purely negative view of freedom. Hegel sought to show that on its own terms, this conception of freedom would necessarily prove insufficient and lead to a drive towards a more complex and sophisticated account. The main issue with this type of freedom is that although I can act on my many desires, the fact that these desires are arbitrary and naturally occurring means that they could be considered a source of unfreedom. If we don't reflect on our desires or rationally consider if they're a positive influence on our lives, then to what extent are we really free? Hegel follows the Stoic idea that was taken up by many of his generation. Can I in fact be a slave to my own arbitrary desires? Acting on our every impulse doesn't allow us to live more complex and developed lives, where we set principles and norms to guide our conduct. Hegel follows Rousseau, Kant, and the modern Republican tradition to see political freedom as connected to a notion of virtue and reason. So what should we do about this first inadequate view of freedom? In his youth, Hegel thought that the separation between our natural inclinations and our sense of duty could be reconciled through an aesthetic experience of love. But in his mature political philosophy, he looked to modern social institutions to cultivate individuals as ethical agents. Hegel argued that we have to be concerned with the processes through which our desires are formed. Sections 10 to 25 of the philosophy of right deal with a process that we could call a transformation of our desires. We need to act on our desires and form habit so that our naturally occurring desires become rationally determined aspects of the will. In order to become citizens living in an ethical community, individuals must undergo a process of education and development. Their naturally occurring and unreflected drives have to become new sources of action through mediation with cultural institutions. Morality. The second moral or subjective freedom consists in the ability to be one's own source for the normative principles which govern one's life. In the modern era, human beings see themselves as self-determining agents, meaning they wish to be held morally responsible for their actions. We take satisfaction in choosing paths for our lives and consciously determining our own version of the good. Hegel described this as the moral point of view, which emerged in Rousseau and Kant's philosophy. This is the right to only take actions which accord with one's own moral conscience to which one can personally ascribe. However, even this moral point of view has its limitations. The problem lies in the fact that individual subjects must live together in society. 
Freedom can't be understood as a purely individual enterprise because we need a universal rule that would mediate between different people's ideas of the good. Hegel is very critical of Kant himself, but also of how Kant's ideas get taken up by romantics of his generation, who say things like, we all need to just listen to our hearts and our inner selves and things will be okay. Hegel sees how such a one-sided subjective notion of freedom doesn't solve the problem of living with others and establishing a shared normative framework for society. The moral subject can't be fully self-determining in isolation from other subjects because it relies upon a whole assembly of social institutions to educate and govern it. It's only through taking these into account and the ways in which subjects interact with each other that a more substantive idea of freedom can be determined. For Hegel, Kant's categorical imperative was an empty formalism because it was an abstraction that couldn't say anything specific about particular social roles. Hegel thought that to live a full and rich ethical life, we require the customs and laws of a social community to be truly free. Ethical life. For Hegel, the two above insufficient forms of freedom are incorporated within his highest form of ethical life. Here, individuals actualize their freedom through participation in social institutions. In sections 142 to 157, Hegel outlines what he means. The sections on abstract right and morality are revealed as methodological fictions that are designed to show the impossibility of actualizing a form of social life based on these principles. We can't peacefully live with others if we're either doing whatever we want or just following our own moral law. Ethical life is thus the first real beginning of Hegel's political philosophy. In ordering German, the word Zittlichkeit means something like customary morality. It draws our attention to the close connection between morality and social customs. Wouldn't it be great, Hegel thought, if in deciding how to act in any given situation, we could be guided by the customs and habits of our society? Ethical life represented the embodiment of freedom in the world in two distinct ways, objective and subjective. First, it referred to the rational structure of a society's basic laws and institutions, which would all embody rational forms of conduct. These institutions include the family, civil society, and the state. Second, social norms should also be fully present in an individual's subjective disposition and attitude. For Hegel, citizens should be virtuous and disposed to habitually follow the laws and customs of their community, because they see them as rational and an expression of their own desires. This can be a hard idea to grasp, because we're more inclined to see the state as something alien that should be minimised and cautiously monitored. But if you think of much smaller social circles and communities, where people gather together around things like sports, video games, or the celebration of a subculture, you get closer to the kind of relationship that Hegel had in mind. It's a place where you feel at home, a part of a community, and invested in its basic norms. Just like when you join an online group, new members are educated in the basic norms of how you can behave through observing others and gaining an understanding of the rules. All three institutions of the family, civil society, and the constitutional state form part of a cohesive whole. They're all connected and in a certain respect completed in the final sphere of the state. Each of the three elements has its own logic, function, and purpose. Each sphere represents a different kind of relation among its individual members. The three moments of ethical life can also be understood as three alternative modes of human interaction. In the family, we have a particular altruism towards the specific members of our own group. In civil society or the marketplace, we demonstrate a universal egoism or profit-making. Finally, in the political sphere of the state, we display a universal altruism by regarding others as equal citizens. The family. The earliest form of socialization we receive is in the family. For Hegel, the sphere of the family involves intimate relationships in which our actions are essentially other-oriented. We're connected to others in the family through love, which he describes as a natural feeling. There is an unreflective and immediate nature of this relationship. Participation in the life of the family is about ensuring the mutual flourishing of all family members. 
Unlike social contract theorists who move from the individual to the state, the family is the natural starting point for Hegel because he sees it as the most immediate and natural form of association. It's also the first point of the development of culture and habit. For Hegel, an individual can never be the initial starting point, but can only emerge as the result of a process of development. In the sphere of the family, Hegel had in mind a traditional, heterosexual bourgeois family unit. A family would be formed through a marriage of a man and a woman when they enter into a monogamous relationship. He didn't agree with Kant that a marriage should be considered as a contract. For Hegel, marriage was an ethical connection and a substantive unity between two people that was qualitatively different from a contract. Marriage involved love, trust, mutually shared feelings, and a sharing of one's whole existence. But nor was Hegel a complete romantic. He criticised his nemesis, the romantic philosopher Friedrich Schlegel, for suggesting that if we are in love, we can do away with the institution of marriage altogether. The purpose of the family for Hegel was to develop legal citizens and ethical subjects who would emerge from the family capable of holding free property and entering into civil society. Like in the philosophy of John Locke, Hegel thought that parents had a right to discipline and teach their children, but that children were not the property of their parents. Children had an implicit rationality and personhood that had to be respected. But Hegel didn't think that a personal connection of love was a proper relationship fit for all aspects of social life. He was well read in political economy and saw that commercial society involved the development of a complex and indirect system of the satisfaction of our needs. We needed to be able to relate to others in the sphere of the marketplace, not as kin, but as economic agents trying to satisfy our own needs. We would do this in what Hegel called the sphere of civil society. Civil society. Hegel saw that the division of labour, the development of industry, and the increase in production and consumption had dramatically changed modern societies. He studied the British economists and saw how commercial activity was rapidly transforming the world. Individuals participate in the economic sphere as independent agents looking to satisfy their own needs and make profit. They would treat other individuals as a means to their own end and pursue their own rational self-interest. But like Adam Smith, Hegel thought that a public good could be generated out of each individual pursuing their own self-interest. In commercial societies, individual needs would become social needs. This is what Hegel refers to as a system of needs. This is the satisfaction of human needs through social processes of labour, exchange and consumption. Once needs are socialised, the ways in which they can be satisfied becomes more diverse. One is no longer simply hungry, one desires particular types of food to be consumed in particular ways and forming part of certain social practices. Social needs can't be satisfied without the cooperation of others. This generates an all-round interdependence in which one's needs become entirely connected with the needs of others. Therefore, one's own welfare and rights will depend on the rights and welfare of the collective. The importance of political economy in Hegel's view is to see the rationality and universality in the satisfaction of purely subjective needs. The key concept in this process is the mediation of labour or work. It's through work in civil society that an individual gains an ethical consciousness. It leads from an immediate natural standpoint through a series of mediations to a universal standpoint. Hegel thought that labour had an educative function in allowing people to participate in economic life and learn how their own needs were tied up with the needs of a larger collective. We develop a system of law and the administration of justice for the protection of property. Such a system makes explicit the universality that binds people together in an ethical community. Hegel thinks property and the administration of justice emerged out of the sphere of civil society, but because it's still concerned with the arbitration of private property, it hasn't yet been raised to the universal level of the state. The Problem of Poverty In Hegel's system, in which everything seemingly gets reconciled into a higher unity, it's an odd exception that he offers no solution to the problem of poverty. He realised that industrial capitalism inevitably creates, as one of its necessary byproducts, an ever-growing mass of immiserated people who were trapped in poverty. 
The wealthy, he thought, had an interest in maintaining the existence of a poor class, which he called the rabble, whose bargaining power would be weak in relation to capital. The rabble would develop a hostile attitude to the rest of society because they would feel excluded and shut out. He was most concerned about poverty not as an economic injustice, i.e. that some have more than others, but about the negative effects of property on the social integration of individuals. Without a job and a sense of independence and self-worth, individuals would lose their feeling of dignity and that they had an equal membership in the political community. This is why charity and redistribution wouldn't work for Hegel, because although it provides economic benefit, it fails to allow individuals to feel self-sufficient. The rabble for Hegel seemed to be a necessary aspect of commercial society, which is a problem that could only be managed rather than solved. Like in Aristotle, Hegel also thought that there was a corresponding antisocial attitude amongst the ultra-rich. They tended to see themselves as outside of the normal social sphere. The rich and poor alike would come to regard ethical principles of civil society with scorn. As Hegel presents no solution to this problem, these economic inequalities represent a problem irresolvable within the parameters of Hegelian political philosophy. The corporation. One of the institutions that's designed to prevent people from falling into poverty, but does so imperfectly, is Hegel's system of estates and corporations. They closely resemble medieval guilds, and are as a result an unusual aspect of Hegel's system, given that the developments in capitalism meant that guilds were less and less important. But Hegel believed that some form of workers' organisation would be necessary. This organisation could provide resources and assistance to workers, and it would be able to mediate between workers' claims and the universal state. Corporations would admit members in accordance with their objective qualifications and skill, and they would be designed to protect them against particular contingencies and provide them with education. Hegel describes these corporations as like a second family. If for Hegel the family is the first ethical foundation of the state, then the corporation is the second, as it's based in civil society and is universal in nature. There are three main estates in Hegel's society, the agricultural estate of all the farmers, the trade and industry estate of industrial workers and craftspeople, and finally the universal estate, which are the bureaucrats and public servants of the government. It's at the universal and rational level of the bureaucracy where the power in Hegel's system lies. His society is one administered by a class of public servants, whose office is open to all based on talent and should run the state in accordance with universal principles of reason. Because the end or purpose of the corporation is universal, it acts as a mediator between civil society and the state. It's the bridge between the individual's particular interests and the universal interests of the state. The state. Unlike in liberal political theory, the state isn't viewed as a neutral upholder of the rule of law and protector of individual property. Rather, it's something that transcends the partisan positions of the individual and embodies a universal concept of the shared norms of society. The state to Hegel is universal altruism, a mode of relating to others not through our self-interest, but out of solidarity of other human beings living in our community. It's a political sphere of the public realm where legislation is framed and executed in accordance with a shared conception of the good. The diversity of citizens and their different positions within civil society is incorporated into the state by integrating the particular wills of individual citizens into the general will of the state. Individuals are capable of embracing the ends of the state as their own only if they're able to experience their roles as citizens as a source of their own identity. The state provides all citizens with this shared sense of a universal project. Law doesn't feel like an external imposition, but as an expression of each individual's will combined in the institutions of the state. The state is divided between three main functions, the executive, the legislature, and the sovereign. The legislature is comprised of elected representatives from the different estates. As the estates of civil society group their members according to their common interest, and as the deputies elected from the estates to the legislative bodies give voice to those interests within the deliberative processes of the legislation, the outcome of this process should give expression to the general interest. The final say on this process for Hegel has to be given by a monarch. 
Hegel stated that the monarch's job in reality would be to simply dot the I's and cross the T's. It's the role of the legislature to diminish antagonisms and disagreements and reconcile society's different interests. The monarch is the mere symbol of the unity of the state. Hegel opposed any attempt to invest the monarchy with the reality of power or to ground its position on any kind of legitimist argument. Hegel goes on to describe how the state would interact with others in the sphere of international relations and how it would progress in world history, but I don't cover those aspects here. One of Hegel's major philosophical problems was attempting to reconcile the basic divisions of modern life between humanity and nature, humanity and God, and individuals from each other. All of this was caused by the rise of the physical sciences, the division of labour, and modern rationalist philosophy. His earliest ideals were largely those of German classicism, which included a dual concept of harmony, harmony within each individual and between individuals in a community. The idea of human subjects needing to find satisfaction and to feel at home in their world has a special place in Hegel's political thought. For Hegel, the state represented a sphere of universality in which individuals could not only live freely, but could also feel recognised as equal members of a community and reconciled in their social world. 